AI decision systems permeate our lives, now what? Moderator Yuta Trevoranis, speakers Merv Hickok and Clayton Lewis. Welcome Merv and Clayton to this session of Site Tech Global. It's wonderful to have you both here. And I'm not going to introduce the two of you. If you really, if I really did your introduction justice, it would probably take all of our time. And we have so many important things to cover. Um, I think suffice it to say, we all have thought long and hard about how do we make decisions about the nature of human and machine intelligence. And we're worried about the risks of the current course of innovation. And we've devoted our careers to finding more inclusive trajectories. I wonder if you want to add something relevant about your particular background, Merv and Clayton. Uh, absolutely. And I'll be very brief about it. I'm the founder of AIethicist.org, and my work focuses on bias and social justice in general. I'm also the research director at Center for AI and Digital Policy, so working on the policy, advocacy, and regulation side of AI and algorithmic systems. And I also work for an organization that develops uh, and uses learning systems for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So um, a lot of complementary uh, work and thank you for having us here. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention that uh, I was drawn into an interest in current developments in AI in my former role as co-director for technology at the Coleman Institute for Cognitive Disabilities and uh, in, in pursuing uh, possibilities for using AI to support people with disabilities. Uh, I was really uh, led to learn about very recent developments, which are, I think, really uh, transformative. Uh, potentially, we hope for the good, but uh, there are also risks. Thank you, both of you. So for decades, I've been worried about the impact of statistical reasoning on people who have lives that are different from the statistical average or norm. Um, now the same reasoning is made more efficient, accurate, and consistent through the pervasively deployed artificial intelligence systems. What are the implications of statistical reasoning applied in current AI systems? And how is this compounded by recommender systems that encourage affinity grouping? Wendy Chun's contention is that current AI systems mechanize eugenics and segregation. How does this play out, Merv? I, I wonder if you can comment on this given your role. Yeah, absolutely. And let me start with, uh, you know, we, there, there is already a difference between our ideal world of just an equitable world, right? We don't know society in the world. I guess to live that uh, uh, op op optimum state, uh, we replicate. We have our biases. We have our discriminatory histories, and and um, so in our society as well as our structural biases in the institutions, and still trying to resolve those. So all the data that we're looking to uh, work on that relates to human to human interactions, interactions of uh, consumers or citizens or humans in general with different institutions carries that injustice and equity. And what we do with that data is then replicating if you're not uh, taking uh, precautions and safeguards or maybe even uh, take the option of not launching an algorithmic system or AI system, what we do is kind of replicating and deepening and magnifying those uh, injustices of the past as well. How these biases, uh, especially against what is called as outliers uh, or differences from the statistical norm is we build these systems usually for um, without much consideration of who is in those, um, who, who is on the tail ends of those statistical distributions and what their experiences are. And in terms of real life experiences, for example, if you're not recognized by a system to make it work for you or work it optimally as it works for a lot of other people, uh, you might be encountering physical, psychological, emotional harms and repeating harms at that you know, it's not just once or one system, you get, you, you have that repeat, uh, repeat in multiple <laughs> systems. 
um, or you end up trying to fit into the system's expectations of trying to change your accent, your pronunciation, your pitch, eye contact, smile, posture, you name it. You are trying, to, you're shifting yourself to fit into those expectations. And worst case, um, if you're considered an outlier or error in the systems, it means that you might not be getting the opportunities such as jobs or education or resources such as housing, insurance, loans, etc., cetera, that um, other in the society get to enjoy and someone is making uh, those decisions for you by function of this, uh, creating the systems and expectations and, and norms in those systems. So a lot of people think AI is something of the future, but can you tell us a little bit about how pervasively it is employed? What decisions is it making um, for the companies that and the governments and the schools that we interact with? Uh, absolutely. So AI uh, or al algorithmic systems uh, make decisions in housing and uh, who gets who gets housing. Uh, with tenant with tenant screening systems, or who gets to have housing benefits if you're getting it from uh, if you're getting any government benefits, and to that effect, all the other government benefits at federal or state level or in different countries, uh, uh, national level, we depend on these algorithmic systems now. Um, in school education, in education systems, access to uh, schools. Um, uh, access to job opportunities as we're going through hiring processes, performance management processes, or productivity uh, scores. Uh, we see this in health decisions on who gets to be prioritized for uh, crucial health interventions or health diagnostics at uh, even for certain use cases. We see it in policing, law enforcement, uh, border control, immigration, asylum and refugee systems. We see them in credit scoring of who gets to get a credit in the first place or at what, uh, for example, uh, uh, interest level that you get that credit. Similarly, loans, do you get it or what kind of loans you can, what kind of insurance that you can get, what kind of coverage or at what levels, et cetera. It even, uh, we even interact with them in uh, pricing of the products that we buy with recommender systems and pricing systems, what kind of news that you get to see, uh, and as well as other opportunities and interesting things. So these systems are making uh, decisions, especially the recommender systems, but what you get to see, uh, what you get to experience, uh, and how do you uh, access these systems and opportunities as well. And possibly even influencing how you say things, um, what you send to people, what you share, what you don't share. Absolutely. Yeah. So people with disabilities are often used as the poster child of AI innovation, the ability to recognize images and tell whether you're going to go um, and take the wrong pills or go into the, the wrong subway entrance is uh, life changing. But even there, if your world is not the world the system is trained on. What are the implications? And is it likely to recognize and work for you if you are in an unusual context? Uh, well, one of the issues with, especially since the systems are dependent on the data sets that are built on them, as well as the, the uh, what you train the system or, or what kind of use cases you've, uh, you've included. Uh, if, you treat especially, especially abilities and the spectrum of abilities as this homogeneous uh, thing. Uh, one, you might be missing on a number of uh, abil uh, disabilities. You might be missing on different manifestations of um, abilities and disabilities. And you might be missing on the intersection of like how these disabilities manifest themselves or how do you get to experience that and uh, in different contexts, in different cultures, in different uh, locations as well. So there is a whole host of um, uh, complexities uh, that go into the systems or should go into the consideration and development in, of these systems in the first place. So even if you're not, uh, even if you're, uh, you think that you have a 
representative data set, there are still a lot of assumptions in your thinking that you are representative or your data set is representative. Uh, so if you, to your point, Yuta, uh, if you're interacting with the system in a way that doesn't recognize the way the system was trained, um, the comment is different, the lightning behind the light behind you is different. Uh, if it's, a, for example, a computer vision system or the sounds or background sounds or the pitch, et cetera, is different, or even the way that you pronounce or put a sentence together is different, the system, again, might not work for you. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of the assumptions and not treating especially a lot of our identities as homogeneous identities to start with, but especially in the case of uh, uh, disability, uh, we there are a lot of um, different manifestations, intersections, and considerations that need to go into that. Yeah, and the the effect of the bias is cumulative, isn't it? I mean, if you are if most of the training happened in a typical middle class neighborhood with typical middle class products and you try to use a recognition system in a, say, rural um, uh, setting where the products are not typical, the neighborhood is not typical, what's the likelihood that it will be uh, as accurate as it is in the trained environment? So um, the what happens is there are all of these interacting cumulative effects in terms of who it works for and who it doesn't. Is that, is that also your perception? It is also my perception, and I use the concept of like cumulative disadvantages, uh, a point that was turned a while ago, but I, my interaction with it is through Oscar Gandhi. Uh, I use that a lot because I tend to draw like long term implication, or I tend to try to figure out the long term implications and harms in any system. You know, what happens if this connect is. is if something is connected to others. So in this case, um, you know, we, I'm really concerned about these systems becoming interacted, or sorry, interconnected uh, uh, with each other. So you, as you interact with, for example, banking, insurance, loans, housing, employment, whatever, these systems become interconnected and one, this, one biased result or one harmful bi harmful result from one system becomes interconnected and becomes a bigger problem in another system. Um, or things that you don't have control over, you're disadvantaged and harmed, and uh, you just go deeper into that uh, disadvantage hole, whether <laughs> we want to uh, do that, you know, um, conceptualize as that, or conceptualize harm, for example, as a, as a snowball, it just keeps building on each other and it becomes a vicious cycle. Um, so if you're not considering these harms in, in each of these systems, as well as their interactions, we're creating a very uh, bleak future where we are permanently lacking people out of resources and opportunities. So you mentioned representation, and there's now a proliferation of AI ethics companies that will audit and certify your AI as ethical. And one of the things that they attempt to address is data gaps, or in fact, uh, what, what's called data deserts. Um, are those going to... Uh, are they effective? Um, because what's happening is that people are spending, companies are spending uh, quite a bit of uh, money to measure the AI ethics and to receive a certification as being ethical. Um, do you think this addresses the, the issues that we've been talking about, the cumulative harms? Uh, I think the, there's definitely a step in a positive direction but that is definitely cannot be uh, the only solution or only control over the systems. Um, and these audits, these criteria, these controls, checks and balances also need to include the people who are impacted by the systems, right? A lot of the time you're talking about uh, someone coming in using this criteria or the, the models that they build, audit models that they build to assess without having that um, experience um, 
or, or, or knowledge of different kind of harms uh, and how they manifest uh, as well. But there is also the piece about, uh, in general, uh, so yeah, setting the audits aside, when we use statistics, we're dependent on quantified data, right? But not everything is quanti quantifiable and not everything is easily quantifiable. So it means that as you build these algorithms, as you collect this data, uh, you make decisions about what counts, what counts as a measurable proxy for the behaviors and interactions that you're interested in. It also means that we may not be able to capture the qualitative elements of what makes us humans, the complex of our choices, behaviors, it means we're um, attempting to capture that fluidity and complexity of the experience, uh, but without success, hence creating a whole host of harms and, and biases. Um, and if I may hear, uh, I might be uh, throwing a bit of a, a curve, additional curveball here, uh, kind of moving away from the others maybe, but also for me, there's the element of a very problematic tendency of treating some constructed concepts such as race uh, as something biological, as something quantifiable, as something uh, you know objective in itself. Uh, you know, we first come up with this political concepts or social concepts such as race, for example, uh, which actuality denotes difference between individuals. Uh, and we forget about histories, we forget about our discriminatory histories, uh, where these concepts are, or constructs were used in what um, you know context, uh, for what political purposes they were used. Um, and then we come as statistics, which has a lot of historical baggage in itself. Uh, we come to statistics and try to treat these concepts as scientific, unbiased, impartial categories and technologies. So for me, there is already that from the nature of it, there are some, um, there are a lot of issues that we need to consider when we're depending on data, depending on statistics, depending on models. And add on top of that, all the uh, other assumptions and decisions that we make, audits and you know certifications come at the very end, end of that. And you're all, you already have a, a, a huge pile that you need to work through and how you audit that and how you certify that on whether we should is a whole different question then. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm somewhat worried about the false assurances and the dismissal of uh, the, the bias that you've been talking about. And certainly in our, um, modeling, even if we get rid of all of the data gaps, even if we have full proportional representation and we remove those areas that you're talking about, the human racism, sexism, and ableism from the algorithms, we still have the issue of statistical reasoning and its bias against uh, those outliers and already excluded minorities that are not part of the training set. And that takes us, I think, to to your topic, uh, Clayton. Um, there is there are emerging systems within AI which do not use statistical reasoning, um, but um, with every new uh, innovation that uh, is going to disrupt our lives, there are risks and opportunities. So Clayton, what are some of the risks and opportunities of the emerging large language models? Uh, that don't employ this statistical reasoning? Do the systems have the potential to ameliorate uh, some of the discrimination against outliers and differences that Merv was talking about? Um, and uh, what what do you advise <laughs> or what what you can what can you predict? Yeah, maybe, maybe before going directly into that, I wanted to to, to maybe uh, reflect a little on some of what Merv was saying, and, and step back and, and note that any system that's trained on, on data uh, of past decisions, which most of these systems are, they have the, they have the property that they kind of tie us to our past. Mm -hmm. And as people, we should, we should be thinking about our aspirations. So not, not what we've accomplished, but what we aspire to accomplish. 
And and I worry that these systems really hold us back from that and say, well, we're just going to reproduce what we what we've been doing. We're trying to tune it up a little bit. And yeah, all data is from the past. <laughs> yeah, and there's a connection there. So these large language models, things like GPT three and its many uh, its many successors, have some properties that may offer some real benefit here. Uh, these systems have the feature that they can they can at least appear to do something like reasoning, and they can process not just uh, actually they're they're better at. Uh, at processing sort of assertions and propositions rather than data in the traditional sense. So they don't run off, you know, tables of, of cases, they run off large volumes of text that embody things people have said about things. And remarkably, this includes inferences. So that means that these systems like people may be able to operate at the level of aspiration and policy in addition to the level of, you know, what, what experience has been. Indeed, as they are now, uh, they, it's not really possible to sort of load in a bunch of data about past hiring decisions. Uh, but I think uh, the fact that that can't be done now, that's, that's temporary. I'm confident there are already a few systems emerging that have the ability to consult data as well as to uh, process uh, 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 propositions, sentences, uh, policy statements, and so on. So we can imagine systems that will be much more like people than current systems are in that they can operate at both levels. They can respond to historical data, but they can also respond to assertions, ethical values, policy statements, and, and things like that. So that may sound pretty good uh, in that uh, they they may deal with uh, they they may indeed deal with some of the uh, the issues that Merv has um, has laid out, uh, but there are a lot of uncertainties and therefore risks that um, uh, that remain. So one thing is, as these systems are now, they're quite inconsistent in their judgments. That may not be all bad actually, but uh, from some points of view, it's a it's it's a serious um, it's it's a serious limitation, but. Uh, for me, there are risks in a couple of areas. Uh, uh, so one is we don't understand how these things work. And, and so it's going to be difficult to be confident that they will act according to some ethical aspiration that might be stated, for example. We don't know uh, the, how reliable uh, that behavior is going to be. They're even but, more inscrutable than... Sorry? They're, they're even more inscrutable in some ways, yes. yes. That, that's right. We, we, we have very little insight into how they work in, in particular cases. But a, another a, a feature that they have that I think exposes another category of risks is uh, they're clonable like other dis digital systems. And, and that means that there's the potential, and this relates to MERV's interconnection uh, concern, there's, there's the potential that instead of having, as today, you know, myriad many different people making decisions about, for example, hiring, we may reach a situation where there's really a single system that's making huge numbers of these of these decisions with, with all the risks that, that are uh, entailed there. So I'm concerned about the lack of diversity going forward, which again has the feature of kind of tying us down. So instead of allowing us to flexibly respond as our aspirations change, as our experiences change, I worry that that we'll be uh, dealing with you know large systems that are operating everywhere and uh, that we don't understand very well, and uh, that will be difficult to uh, to change. Yeah, and especially as they cost so much to create, which means only very large, powerful players are able to create the original ones, which then can be transferred. Um, so that that may mean that there's uh, we are we're encouraging an even greater monoculture. Um, one thing you mentioned about training and the, the additional opportunities for giving instruction. Um, I'm a professor and the first course that I teach in my program is called Unlearning and Questioning. This is a graduate course that is necessary to overcome the years of socializing the students have been exposed to. Among the things to unlearn is the no notion of average humans, 
the social Darwinist notion of survival of the fittest, the sorting, labeling, and rankling, ranking of humans, and the idea of quick wins by ignoring the difficult um, things in the 80-20 rule, and also the folly of ignoring the entangled, complex, adaptive system we live in uh, when we plan and predict. All of these are deeply embedded in the data um, or the training uh, language that, or the, the data sets that the systems are trained on. How do we teach the systems to unlearn this? I mean, if we're handed these large language models trained on a mammoth amounts of uh, scraped data, what, how do we go about having the same unlearning and questioning uh, process? So I think as of now, we just don't know how to do that. You, you can find efforts in the literature. People are trying to find ways of diminishing false beliefs and so on. But, but these, are, these are dealing with, with, with pretty simple things. Um, uh, you know, how we could, how we could cause a, posi a, a statement of an aspiration, say a policy aspiration of non-discrimination to, to speak in very simplistic terms. I don't think we know how to make sure that a policy or aspirational assertion like that uh, outweighs what might otherwise be happening in the system based on other aspects of, of the training. Uh, it would be a little bit optimistic. Uh, it's very early days for this technology, and it may be that we'll be successful in developing an understanding of all of that and that we can become more comfortable about it. But that seems pretty far off as, as, as things are now. And so there, there's a worry about the applications of these things outrunning, as usual, our ability to really understand them and their implications. Right. And um, I mean, we usually encourage scaling by diversification and contextual customization. One of the, the positive things that has been stated about these systems is the, trans, the ability to transfer, to change context. Are you optimistic that that might ameliorate some of the, the issues with the monocultures or the, the transfer of this cumulative effect? Well, uh, I think those things operate at, at, at different levels, really. So I think these systems are already showing a remarkable ability to transfer, so to speak, patterns of relationships from one domain to another. It truly is amazing uh, if, if people have played with uh, with with these systems, but I worry that that won't mean that we won't have a monoculture kind of system. You know, whatever the ability of a system is, it may be that's the system that large numbers of people end up end up using, and so that won't mean that uh, that we end up having a diversity of of of, of perspectives. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, well, yeah. Period. I'll just I'll leave that there. So um, to both of you, what should people in the accessibility community watch out for and advocate for individually and collectively as these systems emerge? Well, let me go first, but I want to like uh, say one thing about that on, on learning and, you know, possible to teach that uh, to the systems. We see some un you know unsuccessful attempts by technology companies to put fixes in place, right? Like where you see language models or computer vision or search algorithms, et cetera, trying to fix some of those uh, biased results by certain uh, patch fixes, uh, which ends up, again, you're making determinations or you're making judgments about what should be fixed and how it should be fixed. And the result becomes people talking about their religion, people with disabilities talking about their disabilities or their identities or their experiences are marked as toxic or dangerous speech. And they're again, um, uh, you know, biased and, and discriminated against. So I would be very curious of how, like who gets to decide how, what should be unlearned and how should be unlearned um, and to, to apply those to those systems. Uh, but in terms of uh, your question on, you know, what should we advocate for individual and collectively, I'll come 
I want to come back to the uh, issue of cumulative disadvantages and interconnected systems. This is not only for the accessibility community. This is for every one of us in different uh, in different ways because uh, we all have experience our identities, different parts of our identities, whether it's age, ability, sex, gender, religion, you name it, in different ways. So as these beca systems become more prevalent in our lives, um, uh, they're going to be yet more impactful and connected. So I think it goes for all of us to um, kind of individually advocate for acknowledgement of these harms and ask for uh, legal remedies and safeguards and a, a control mechanism where some systems should not be uh, launched or used in certain contexts to start with. Uh, and now for collective uh, advocacy, I want to highlight two things. One is the, um, again, intersectional identities and power, which comes from the intersectional identities. We can advocate and innovate better and create better if we understand that those uh, you know, combinations and different dimensions that make each of us connected. And second, a lot of the conversation on AI ethics and policy uh, are still very much Western centric and prioritizes Western values. Um, a lot of the, you know, similarly, a lot of the major data sets that we use, the systems from large language models to computer vision to object identification within that are also based on, you know, Western societies and Western cultures and Western languages. So our, uh, I think collectively we can advocate for um, bigger connections and wider communities and insights and kind of try to go beyond our own circles. Uh, and if we're acknowledging that if you're uh, experiencing harms and bias in, in one context that, especially in the Western cult, in, in the Western countries systems, that there's a higher risk of those harms and damages in, in outside of that circle. And how do we get in front of that um, before catastrophic uh, issues happen? Right, yeah. Recognizing our, our differences and valuing our differences. Thank you. And Clayton, I wonder if you have advice. Yeah. Uh, actually, I wanted to... Uh, Linked to uh, an argument that Phil Agri makes one one of more than one in his paper surveillance and capture as models of privacy. So he warns against capture, as he calls it, which is the tendency for automated systems or computerized systems in general to displace human agency, and and that's what we're talking about here. So in the name of efficiency. We're taking ourselves as people out of key decisions we make about one another. Uh, and we're, of course, flawed, but uh, we're, we're flawed in, in ways that offer hope uh, for, for progress of a sort that I don't see in the in increasing ad adoption of these kind of automated systems where, where people are not, are, are, they're advocating responsibility and make judgments about other people as humans. To, to systems whose, whose basis has the kinds of problems that we're talking about here. So uh, I think we all as people really need to push back as much as we can against this idea that somehow decisions shouldn't be made by people, they should be made based on data or, or automated systems or, or whatever. Uh, because I think we are, we are marginalizing ourselves and, and doing a lot of harm in the process. Yeah people over efficiency, consistency, and um, automation, right? Yes. yes. Thank you so much. And unfortunately, we've run out of time. There's still so much to say, but hopefully we can continue this conversation at another time. And thank you for bringing both of your perspectives. Thank you for having us. Thank you.